Good evening and welcome to the New Bugaisky Hour from Washington, D.C. I would like to thank Voice of America for hosting the Washington episodes of my show for RTK. And today I will be discussing important international questions with a major U.S. security analyst. Our guest on the Bugaisky hot seat is Damir Marusic, executive editor of the American Interest in Washington, D.C. But first, my political commentary on a key international topic is entitled Europe's Cold War with America. In recent weeks, senior EU leaders have attacked the Donald Trump administration, claiming that the transatlantic link is disintegrating, as evident in the failed G7 summit. Such rhetoric is counterproductive and exposes the EU to charges of hypocrisy and weakness. Top EU officials condemn Trump for abandoning several multilateral accords, including the Paris Climate Agreement and the Iran nuclear deal. European Commission Vice President Franz Timmermans stated that Trump was the first US president to favor a divided Europe. German Foreign Minister Sigmar Gabriel asserted that even after Trump leaves the White House, relations with the United States will never be the same. It is irresponsible to declare America's geostrategic relationship with Europe to be dead simply because of one election. America and Europe continue to share the same fundamental interests and Trump's national security officials are not the isolationists that some EU leaders are claiming. Europe remains heavily dependent on the United States for its security. The White House has actually strengthened the NATO alliance over the past year and key US officials harbor few illusions about Russia, in fact fewer illusions than some of President Obama's appointees. Europeans themselves share responsibility for any decline in transatlantic relations. In recent opinion polls, it transpires that most Germans, Italians and French favor neutrality and oppose defending a NATO ally if it is attacked by Russia. Such a position is much more damning than anything that Trump has stated, either as candidate or president. Europe is a declining continent in terms of population, gross domestic product and military spending. The proposal that the European Union form an independent humanitarian pole of power to compete with a rising China, an assertive Russia and the restless Middle East without US leadership is absurd. Exaggerated attacks on the Trump administration will not result in greater European Union unity. On the contrary, disputes between Brussels and Washington simply widen rifts between European states that value the US military presence and those fickle West Europeans who have taken the American security umbrella for granted. The values and interests uniting the US and Europe will survive one presidency, unless of course European leaders decide to make any ruptures permanent. Europeans can start to unwind the transatlantic alliance, but they do so at their peril. If the US truly withdrew from Europe, the EU would face a stark choice, whether to vastly increase its defense budget at the cost of its social spending, or simply throw its hands in the air and surrender to Putin's Russia. It is time now for the Bugaisky Hot Seat with our special guest, Damir Marusic, uh, executive editor of the American Interest, uh, one of the leading policy journals in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the show, Damir. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Uh, to begin with, uh, for our viewers' benefit, can you tell us about the American Interest and its significance, its role and significance in Washington, where it stands politically and and so forth. Um, yeah, we uh, started in, uh, I think now it's 2005, so it's been a while. Uh, it was a magazine started by, uh, among others, Francis Fukuyama, um, mm -hmm. Elliot Cohen, and Josef Joffe, uh, uh, who uh, of Die Zeit. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we started in the tradition of uh, several sort of policy journals, uh, you know, that sort of dominated uh, discussion in Washington uh, for a long time. Uh, there was uh, the national interest and 
goodness, uh, there's a domestic version in any case. National interest is foreign policy and the... Foreign affairs as well, yeah. Yeah, uh, so what the American interest wanted to do was to do both, domestic mm -hmm. and foreign policy. Mm -hmm. um, and we are a, um, uh, started as a bi-monthly journal. Um, we still publish a print product, but of course the internet. Uh, so now mm -hmm. we are also on the internet and we publish daily. Um, uh, I've been there since the beginning and um, yeah, we s generally we're seen as uh, being, I think, uh, slightly on the center right. Mm -hmm. uh, but we really do strive to be uh, the kind of publication that that um, gets uh, opinions from all sides of the spectrum. Right. Um, to have it, a debate, yeah. Right. So you're nonpartisan, but you're very much uh, transatlanticist, internationalist, and so forth. Most certainly. Most certainly. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, again, uh, like I was saying, what's interesting about these times right now is that uh, <laughs> with the Trump administration in general, but you see it, I think it's also on the left and the right, um, things are changing. And mm -hmm. we, we, we're trying to, you know, keep up with that and have a debate about it. Mm -hmm. uh, our uh, commitments, uh, my personal commitment, uh, the commitment of, I think, you know, everyone... Uh, who works at the magazine is is towards transatlanticism. That right. uh, it's 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 clearly um, a guiding principle for us. Uh, but um, it's an interesting time to be working in this space. I'll say that. Absolutely. You're actually personally from the region. Your family is from the region as yes. well, from the what we call the Balkans or Southeast Europe. Yes. Um, from Croatia. I That's presume? correct. Yes. Maybe tell us a little bit of background when when you left and um, so forth. I left. Uh, my father worked for the United Nations Development Program, so I actually mm -hmm. um, I was born uh, in, uh, in Yugoslavia at the time, uh, but uh, almost immediately uh, we left and uh, uh, lived all over the world. Uh, I was in Iraq, in Cyprus, and actually mm -hmm. in Pyongyang even. Yeah, I read. <laughs> <laughs> well, can we come back to North Korea a little bit We later, can, right? we can, sure. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, so we traveled all over the place, and then I've been in the States for a very long time. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm an American citizen now, um, I've spent most of my life here. Excellent. Okay, Damir, thanks. Uh, before we start on international security questions, which is really what I want to discuss, uh, I just want to ask you a couple of questions about f what we now call fake news. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I think it's a very overused term, but nevertheless, it's used <coughs> continuously. There is still a difference, I think, between fact and fiction. I think we can all agree on this, well, certainly, yes. between truth and falsehood. How do publications such as the American Interest deal with this, this, this whole phenomenon? Well, you know, I mean... It's interesting. Uh, we're small, uh, so uh, the way we deal with it as a phenomenon as of vetting is uh, we, we get the people that we trust. Uh, we don't necessarily take pe think pieces off the transom. If they come over the transom, we definitely mm -hmm. do the due diligence on it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, we can talk more about the, the phenomenon of fake news. It's definitely uh, uh, a thing, but uh, from my perspective, it's... Uh, Part of the reason that we, we talk so much about it uh, is because politics are changing around us. And uh, far too many times I feel that we talk about fake news as a means of explaining what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes I, I, I really do feel that, that what needs to um, happen is that we recognize how much this is a political crisis mm -hmm. and that the information warfare aspect of it, while real, I'm not, I'm not diminishing it at all, uh, is really just a, a force multiplier. I mean, it's, it's so the way, though, of course, you know, we've published many pieces on the phenomenon of, of you know, the fake news and propaganda. Mm -hmm. uh, my personal belief is that, that uh, now as we move forward, we really need to be talking about, about politics, about the issues that are driving these things, because mm -hmm. it's far too easy to say mm -hmm. that um, uh, to make the false consciousness argument about voters uh, in all these democracies, that they're being manipulated and mm, that you right. know, the migrant issue, for example, across Europe, uh, these people aren't actually threatened and yet they have these beliefs. Um, in democracies, we have to uh, look at some of these beliefs as, as the thing that politics is waged on and mm. then start from that as a premise and move forward. I, I suppose the one, the one difference is um, it, it's not just a question of Propaganda, in other words, one country trying to sure. convince uh, another population, another country that their system is better, mm. as, as we had during the, the Cold War. Now it's a question of so many people are, uh, evidently making news, social media. Yeah. Uh, how do you put the social media in this perspective? I, I guess the way I look at it is this: um, when you see how uh, Emmanuel Macron won in France, mm -hmm. um, he had a very clear, I think, message. Mm -hmm. 
Now, it's true, you know, it wasn't a slam dunk win. It wasn't a clear win that it would happen all the way through. He, he in many ways, uh, s snuck through the system. Uh, but it's, I think it's, it's important that uh, our political leaders up until now, I, I think they've been coasting to a large extent uh, since the end of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of assumptions uh, were uh, for granted, um, and they didn't, weren't making the case to voters so much mm -hmm. about these things. They said, well, this is how it is. Mm -hmm. And in that space, I think, when you get social media opening up, uh, you have a sort of uh, calcified, ossified um, political elite that's speaking uh, uh, about a certain set of issues, um, mm -hmm. taking all sorts of things for granted, uh, if these things are not properly uh, argued for mm. to voters, mm -hmm. uh, that opens up a space uh, for social media, for mm. a lot of people mm -hmm. making their own news, and for a lot of manipulation as a result. Um, I would argue that, that the large uh, problem for liberals, uh, you know, transatlanticists, mm -hmm. uh, Democrats across Europe is that they've been caught flat-footed mm -hmm. by a lot of these changes. Yeah. I don't see that that's necessarily a permanent thing, and I think we'll look back on the, the fake news and social media thing once, again, the, a new generation of politicians comes up with the kind of values, with the kind of ideas that, um, that quite frankly, again, Macron has successfully shown how, mm -hmm. to, how to bring into the political discussion. Um, and we'll look back on this as, uh, as a transition period to a new kind of politics that um, incorporates all these things in a you know, healthier way. And I think some of this uh, is, is reflective of what I want to talk about now, uh, the sort of disillusionment with what we call the establishment or mm. the elite, mm. the, the major political parties. And that's, that's a feature both in Europe and in the United States. Yes. Um, and I suppose the, the Trump presidency rode on the back of that disillusionment yes. uh, to, 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 to be elected. Let, let's turn to the international side mm -hmm. of uh, the D Donald Trump uh, presidency. Uh, do you see a doctrine emerging, a Trump doctrine? Uh, we've had a year and a half of the Trump administration. How, how do you view it? No, I, I, I don't think there's a Trump doctrine. Mm -hmm. um, the interesting thing about trying to write about what's going on right now uh, in Washington uh, is that, um, in a sense, there still are uh, almost two Trump administrations mm -hmm. operating in parallel. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a, um, a whole set of uh, civil servants, uh, you know, permanent people, and even uh, people that have been hired by the Trump administration's mm -hmm. political appointees that are, in fact, um, at least on the, you know, uh, on the transatlantic and the European side of things, still mm -hmm. very much clear on, uh, I think, the sane way to approach uh, the very real problems facing countries on both sides of the, mm -hmm. uh, right. um, of the ocean. And uh, to a certain extent, these people have been doing their best to sort of do their job mm -hmm. um, with uh, the, the fact that the White House, to a large extent, has allowed them to do their job mm -hmm. um, for at least the better part of last year. Um, as of this year, uh, there's a sense that, that Trump is, I think, uh, um, he's less scared of foreign policy. I think mm -hmm. he was, he was uh, maybe uh, overawed by the uh, portfolio when he first came in. Mm -hmm. um, and with the reshuffling and bringing in of John Bolton and uh, Mike Pompeo, mm -hmm. um, there's a sense that the president is more involved now. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I mean, how does this end up basically working? Will a Trump doctrine emerge out of this? I am, uh, I'm not sure because uh, the president has certain inclinations about things, mm -hmm. but not a, a broader vision from what I can tell. Um, the broader vision is still in that, 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 uh, that, that layer underneath mm -hmm. him that I think is, is working on it. Um, and those will clash, I think, in the mm. next two years. Um, and I don't see necessarily a coherent doctrine coming out of that clash. There's sort of contradiction, wouldn't you say, between there's, there's some sort of interventionist uh, um, impulses and there's some isolationist uh, sentiments as well. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, uh, Stephen Sestanovich, uh, I think mm -hmm. at Columbia, wrote a book, uh, uh, Maximalist, um, mm -hmm. two years ago. That's about history of the Cold War leading up through Obama, yeah. and talks about this uh, this vacillation in American foreign policy between, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, being sort of very forward leaning and then feeling some sort of setback, and then having a retrenchment mm -hmm. regime. Right. And uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Sostanovich would have definitely identified Obama as a retrenchment president. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think it's not quite right to say that about Trump. Mm. Uh, it is a strange mix of, mm -hmm. of uh, both, uh, you know, um, unilateralist forward leaning on mm -hmm. certain things, um, but also a sense of uh, maybe a disgust with the world almost and wanting mm -hmm. to pull back, mm -hmm. which I think he shares with Obama. So mm. uh, it's, a, it's an interesting paradox, yeah. There, there is also, I think, uh, a difference between Trump and some of his immediate advisors, if you like, and the national security team, yeah. which is uh, particularly on the transatlanticism, NATO is quite traditionally conservative, yes. internationalist. Yeah. No, I think that's right. And it leads to, um, to, to interesting questions. You know, I mean, uh, the president yesterday uh, with his tweets at, uh, at Angela Merkel uh, over the migrant issue, I mean, uh, some of my friends, we were, we were joking that the president maybe inadvertently helped uh, the mm -hmm. chancellor with that, given mm -hmm. his popularity in Germany. Right. Um, but it's, uh, it, is, is it, it is sort of a, 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 a new thing, because I can't imagine that, that anyone um, in his sort of uh, national security team uh, was thrilled about that. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's a, a new thing for an American president to be uh, really doing that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and, and really, yeah, uh, being that hostile, I think, to, to, to general what are our traditional partners. Mm -hmm. He seems to have a particular thing with Merkel, with Germany, for some reason. He does. You know, at the same time, <laughs> it, the, the, uh, it's important to, you know, uh, people look at Trump's stuff and say that he's uh, either, you know, acting completely on impulse or, or things mm -hmm. like that. When you, when you look at that tweet, uh, at the same time, that was for domestic consumption. It was, uh, mm -hmm. he's fighting a big fight about uh, uh, the issue on the migrants on the yeah. southern border right mm -hmm. now. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the other thing is that, that it's that Trump there, it'd be interesting to see if you actually paired up his sentiments in that tweet about uh, the migration question mm -hmm. and then polled across Europe. Mm -hmm. I would guess that, in fact, he's, uh, more Europeans would be at least sympathetic to if, if it wasn't revealed to them who the speaker was, right, right. because of the hostility to right. the reality of Trump. Um, so it, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting moment uh, at the same time that, you know, he, he is a savvy politician on some of these issues. He knows how to play the game on these things very well. He, he taps into certain sentiments. He certain, certainly does. Certain basic sentiments. That's right. People. That's right. Would you say, turning now to NATO, would you say that uh, NATO has been weakened or strengthened under this administration? Remember, during the campaign, Trump spoke up about uh, you know, NATO obsolescence, that uh, uh, burden sharing, it's all on America, the Europeans aren't pulling their weight, do we need this alliance? Things haven't quite worked out that way since 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 the administration came in. It's true, and again, you know, I mean, one thing we haven't talked about is Congress is the other is the other uh, um, element in all of this. Um, at, as you also know, though, um, uh, the sort of there have been several articles being written around town these days of uh, after the uh, the um, encounter at, in Canada and the G7. Mm -hmm. Uh, that now everyone's very worried about the NATO summit and the president being there, yeah. um, and and what can what can come of this? I, in general, um, I think I'm less concerned about mm -hmm. that for all the reasons that we're saying. I mean, Congress. I mean, there are many breaks on the president from really doing something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, that's truly bad. And, and as you said, again, the 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 odd sort of knock-on effect is that I think our European partners have woken up to a certain reality about. Um, call it, I mean, you know, it's a certain uh, future likelihood of America being more erratic. If that's the one thing that Trump proves mm -hmm. is that, you know, that there are uh, a certain kind of consensus that existed uh, during the Cold War mm -hmm. among Americans has broken down and that Trump represents perhaps an outlier, but I wouldn't say uh, some sort of incredible fringe opinion that this has been some sort of government takeover. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you're likely to see this. And our European partners, I think, have woken up to that to a certain extent and will be investing more in their own defense. Um, I believe that uh, this can be sensibly taken care of and integrated through existing mechanisms and through NATO. And so in that sense, I think NATO will stick around and, and, and will end up uh, being a better uh, alliance going forward. If anything, I mean, you, you've got to give maybe Trump a little bit of credit inadvertently mm. that he has maybe 
frighten some countries that we really need to up our, not only up our budget, but spend more on actual military in terms of the percentage of that uh, GDP of the budget. So, uh, and several countries now made that commitment over several years to reach those uh, targets, yes. which NATO has set. So, so in a way, you could say Trump has encouraged this process. I think it's true. It's true. Um, it's interesting at the same time as is, uh, um, really what, what we get back to the sort of Trump doctrine and what does mm -hmm. he actually believe and want. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, as people you know, try and plumb the depths of our president's soul, they, they, the question is, is how much is he a unilateralist? I mean, what yeah. kind of value does he actually put on, on alliances? You know, there's a, there's a, a good article by someone that I often have uh, uh, disagreements with, Stephen Walt, recently. Mm -hmm. um, I think he made a very good point in all of this, is that uh, the advantages that America has accrued mm -hmm. over the course of the, uh, the Cold War and the post-Cold War period are still so huge that, mm -hmm. that no matter what Trump, at his you know, most erratic, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's going to be hard to squander. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think, very important to keep in mind. That, and uh, in, in that sense, uh, uh, that German white paper that came out last year arguing for, you know, Let's stick through this. Stick with our American partners mm. as best we can through this, and mm. uh, a new uh, a new era will dawn afterwards. It's not completely misguided. Um, mm. I remember when that paper first came out. I was I was thinking to myself that um, uh, it's a little too optimistic because it'll never be back the way it was before. But just because it won't be the way it was before mm. doesn't mean it can't be still a positive uh, a relationship. And that, as you said yourself, some of these <laughs> impetuses mm. that that Trump has uh, induced in our allies uh, lead to a more positive uh, dynamic yeah. after Trump. Right, right. And I think some of the Europeans, the European leaders are, are going over the top. I think the German Foreign Minister Gabriel made a statement that relations with the United States will never be the same again yeah. as a result. I think this is uh, ex exaggerated. Yes. I mean, this is a one-term, possibly two-term presidency. Uh, you know, again, it's. I think. I think it's. It's true that they'll never be the same again. But it doesn't mean that they can't be. I mean, even better, quite mm -hmm. frankly, when you think about it, um, because I think when we we, we look ahead, uh, the challenges in the next fifty years, mm -hmm. um, it's. I think a, a shrinking Russia uh, mm -hmm. and the instability in its uh, in its periphery that that causes, mm -hmm. um, and and a, a growing China. And then when you look at those, this is, you know, 30,000 feet. Uh, it's obviously much more complicated than that. We're not even touching the Middle East, mm -hmm. but the modalities of that with the energy mix changing right. around the world. But let's just take China and Russia as, as two mm -hmm. important sort of poles. Um, and you imagine a Europe that manages to, over time, get its act together. I think that's also uh, a plausible scenario. Not that mm -hmm. Europe will fragment, but that, that, again, some kind of workable Europe will come. Mm -hmm. Perhaps not the maximalist Europe that, that uh, its current uh, most fervent backers imagine, but still a functional Europe that mm -hmm. manages to operate as a unit. If that Europe is a more balanced partner on defense, mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. all sorts of things with the United States, of course the United States and Europe won't agree on everything. And in that sense, uh, this idea that it won't be the same again is correct. But uh, if you look at the world again, overall, I think there's more that will be shared mm -hmm. uh, between Europe and the United States going forward than mm. will, in fact, divide us. Mm -hmm. um, and at the most basic level, I would say um, it's cultural, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Culture will broadly, I think, keep us aligned on, mm -hmm. on the big questions and allow for better cooperation uh, among, I have to see, more co-equal peers rather than mm -hmm. um, this, uh, you know, post-Cold War dependency that we have right now. Right. Culture and I presume the other question, trade, economy. Certainly. Uh, I mean, how does Trump's policy on free trade, which goes against every principle of traditional conservative republicanism, how yeah. does that play out, do you think, vis-a-vis -vis our allies? You know, here's the... Uh, I don't know, is the, the short answer. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> the sort of other short answer is that uh, I think, unfortunately, uh, the United States can withstand um, a medium-term uh, fight with our allies better than our allies can withstand it. I mean, just mm -hmm. generally, it's, right. it's the, again, the sort of trade imbalances. So that's, that's the, 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 the one thing to keep in mind there. 
the other thing to keep in mind is that um, we were mentioning earlier about this sort of new political space. Um, I'm not so certain that that sort of free trade orthodoxy, um, how that plays out politically. Because mm. on the left, the non-center left, the, uh, the Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren side of things, yeah. the progressives, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, they're not that horrified with what Trump's mm -hmm. doing on trade at all. Um, and uh, I don't know how that ultimately plays out. I mean, mm. we're looking at uh, some kind of political realignment, I think, in this country. Mm. Um, and so it's, uh, it's difficult to say. At the same time, again, I think there's, there's, such a, there's so much of a win to be had there, again, with the, the longstanding relationship with the Europeans, mm. that um, there will be tussles, there will be fights, there will mm. be rearrangements of things. But again, I can't imagine that this will be some sort of fatal rupture because, mm. again, I mean, it's, it's, it's too important a relationship. It's too entrenched exactly. for it to be just completely overturned. Let's turn now to the what I think is an important document that was released earlier this year, <coughs> America's new national security strategy, mm -hmm. uh, in which, uh, and again, now we're going to turn to Russia a little bit, which both Russia and China are, are depicted as rivals and competitors. This is almost like a post-terrorism document. Yeah. In other words, terrorism, international terrorism, jihadism is not the main threat anymore to American security. It's there, but it's not the main danger. Um, and it actually, in many respects, goes against what Trump was saying during the elections, that we can work with Putin, we can cooperate with, with, uh, with Russia. Uh, in fact, the text says that, quote, Moscow aims to weaken Washington's international influence and divide us from our allies and partners. Mm. So how do you work with a country that's trying to achieve those goals? Again, I, I, it's uh, how the national security strategy was um, uh, put together is a uh, it's an interesting story that mm -hmm. we still don't know the full details of. We have to wait for the, the, the memoirs to start leaking out, mm -hmm. as, especially as people cycle out uh, sooner uh, rather than later. left recently, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, this is the, the sort of thing I think that really gets at the, the interesting dichotomy between um, Trump himself and a mm -hmm. lot of his advisors. I mm -hmm. think this was a, a very good faith effort uh, made uh, by a staff that understood the world to capture the energy and the sense of um, sort of Trump's more unilateralist instincts, but frame them in this, this broader um, mm -hmm. um, idea framework for how to, to mm -hmm. approach the world. Mm -hmm. The thing about Trump and Russia, um, you know, again, one can, one can endlessly speculate about, mm -hmm. about what's happening. I, I personally, don't think it's it's worth doing. I think the, the Mueller inv investigation should finish, and then we can have a good conversation about what's found out, mm -hmm. what's exactly happening. I do remember, though, it's uh, um, uh, Tom Wright. I think wrote a piece right on the eve of uh, of Trump's election mm -hmm. that that basically pointed out that, that this man has had a very long-standing um, this idea of I mean, going back to the Soviet Union that this is not an uh, an enmity we need to be cultivating, and that if only we can uh, figure it out with them, this is we can split the world, and you know things would be good. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that is a deeply flawed view mm. of uh, of how the Russians see the world, of mm -hmm. the possibilities of what's mm. able to be done. I mean, so to your direct question, I mean, how do you cooperate with the Russians? I, I um, I'm I'm pretty jaundiced about that. I don't mm. think that there's that there's uh, that kind of cooperation anywhere in the offing. It's uh, the better approach is. I mean, you even look at uh, uh, Kennan's long telegram, and he talks about basically, mm. uh, you know, just pushing back. It's it's it mm -hmm. really is. I think that that is the best sort of strategy uh, uh, with this Russian regime is mm -hmm. you, you show them a, a, a firm wall somewhere, <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, and then and then through that you can come to a a sort of temporary stasis. Mm -hmm. uh, but this idea that is prevalent, I think it, it, it occupies Trump's mind. And you see it also, it's, a, it's been a long-standing feature among policy makers and uh, pundits around, around DC is that some sort of equilibrium can be negotiated with Moscow. We have a, a, a document like this almost once a year. Yeah, from no, exactly. <laughs> different institutions comes up. And, and uh, I, I, I really do think that's a, um, 
I guess it, it needs to be aired, and it's fine. Mm. I think it's mistaken. It's, it's, de it's deeply mistaken. Well, one interesting aspe aspect that you brought up, uh, Congress. Congress has been incredibly united on the Russia sanctions question. Yes. In fact, they even uh, reinforced the sanctions that we already had in place under Obama. Um, and, of course, some... Uh, within the Trump populist camp complain about the existence of a weak state, oh, yeah. sorry, of a deep state yeah. that is somehow uh, thwarting Trump's policies. How do you see this uh, relationship between Congress and, and the administration? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because uh, it's not just Congress, right? It's Treasury that ends up pushing these sanctions through. Um, and so, again, it's not, it's not that it's uh, a simple fight between mm -hmm. Congress and, and the executive because mm -hmm. If the executive really was so determined not to sanction, mm -hmm. they really could strangle these in the crib, and they mm -hmm. haven't. Mm -hmm. um, so it, again, it, it's it's this level of, of uh, bedeviling level of complexity as one tries to analyze how this all plays out. Mm -hmm. um, I have heard that you know uh, the uh, initial report on the oligarch report that came out uh, earlier this mm -hmm. year. Uh, that was prepared by Treasury that was roundly mocked uh, as being a cut and paste job from uh, a Forbes to the Forbes list. Russia yeah. billionaire right. list. Uh, that the classified annex was actually quite quite thorough and quite satisfying to Congress. Mm -hmm. So you know, again, this, um, this there is a a working relationship. I think uh, on on many levels uh, mm -hmm. between. Uh, different branches of government here. It's not that the Trump administration, that the Trump loyalists have managed to, to um, uh, fully, uh, well, again, I want to say take over the, the, the stuff, but it, that, I'm not sure that even that's the right model, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. It's that, that there is a, um, uh, the sanctions are an act of the Trump administration, though prompted by Congress. Mm -hmm. um, this latest round that targeted Oleg Deripaska and mm -hmm. uh, Victor Vexelberg, that's the Trump administration. That's not Congress. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, Oleg Deripaska and other Rush Vexelberg, other Russian oligarchs that are part of the, the Kremlin, if you like, foreign policy. Um, Russian revisionism is clearly a challenge to Europe, um, not only meddling in elections, but interfering in domestic politics, society, uh, trying to influence, controlling the media, influencing the message that people get, fostering populism, nationalism to divide Europe. What more can be done uh, by, particularly by the Europeans, but also working in tandem with us to, as you said, push back on what Russia is up to? I, I'm, I think uh, the sanctions regime... Um you know, it, it's 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 healthy for us, if not necessarily as a as a proper deterrent. I mean, we haven't mm -hmm. seen it yet deter Moscow's actions anywhere, mm -hmm. but it's. Uh, I think it, they certainly feel it, and um, you know, the 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 recent uh, move to, uh, you know, at least cause trouble for uh, uh, Abramovich in in, uh, mm -hmm. in England. Mm -hmm. These are these are these are good things, I think, is to, to Except if you're a Chelsea fan like me. If you're me, a Chelsea fan, yes. then you're, 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 you're less happy about that. Uh, but, you know, again, it's, it's, uh, it's just awareness about these things. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the money that flows through is, is huge. And, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, uh, you're never going to be able to eradicate influence and eradicate mm -hmm. the influence of money. But uh, talking about um, some sort of uh, additional laws about transparency, about how campaigns are funded. Mm -hmm. These are all good things, and I, again, these are vary across Europe. Um, that's one step that that can and should be done to again make these sorts of things uh, more apparent mm -hmm. for for where the money's coming from. The scandal that's happening now uh, with the the Brexit and the Iron Bank's uh, funding. Right. Yeah. Still not clear, quite mm -hmm. frankly, exactly what went on there and uh, and what it is uh, that happened. But I mean, th these sorts of stories are important, mm. um, and that's part of the pushback is uh, is an attempt to, to to clarify these things. And I think sanctions are in uh, a very important part of that toolkit. Let us turn now, Dami, to the Balkans. Mm -hmm. um, again, is there a difference in Trump policy towards the Balkans compared to the previous administration, or is there continuity? As I understand it, the previous administration uh, had not devoted a lot of time to the Balkans, mm -hmm. uh, and they recognized it. By the end of the term, they recognized mm -hmm. it. And from having talked to people, as you know, the 
in the, in the Hillary Clinton uh, camp was very much ready to go, and you know they had mm -hmm. already uh, the the whole transition would have been much <laughs> much quicker right. had it uh, had she won. Uh, they were they were ready to devote uh, a lot of uh, time and energy to that. Uh, it's been good to see that this administration has also picked up on uh, on uh, a focus on mm -hmm. the Balkans. Let me caveat that again about in the same sort of way that we've been talking about it up until now. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the Balkans are being handled on the, the lower levels of government at this right. point, and that's good. Um, I, I think that on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, the Balkans are seen as an opportunity uh, for cooperation, for mm -hmm. an ability to get things done. The right. Macedonia name uh, resolution right now, um, hopefully it, it gets ratified and, and everything goes as planned, but this was a, a success of uh, obviously it was a European success, but uh, America mm -hmm. was involved as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a there was, it was mediated on both sides, and, mm -hmm. and uh, this was a great success. Um, so that's very good. The looming problems in Bosnia, however, um, are huge, mm -hmm. and we can we mm -hmm. can talk about those uh, at length. Um, the, uh, you follow closely, I presume, politics in. I, I try to. Yeah, I try to keep up with right. that. Uh, and again, you know, I, just a, a quick story as an aside to give you mm -hmm. a sense of these sort of, you know, two sides of this administration. There's a story that came out recently um, that uh, put uh, Corey Lewandowski and a mm -hmm. couple other lobbyists uh, meeting with uh, Milora Dodik's people. Lewandowski was former, the first Trump campaign manager. First just campaign to manager viewers, yeah. and, and several lobbyists. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of these guys have now right. gone into lobbying, meeting with uh, Milora Dodik's uh, people in mm -hmm. the Republika Srpska. And uh, quite frankly, that just makes me personally nervous because mm -hmm. uh, that's the sort of thing that, you know, um, and I can imagine that, that uh, that's a, a large lobbying effort from across the Western Balkans is to get to the president, to get the president's mm -hmm. attention himself, mm -hmm. to basically then have him reach down um, and, uh, you know, get mm. involved. Uh, I remember Dodik was claiming and his people were claiming after Trump was elected that they got an invite to the inauguration. I mean, they made a big to do about it, basically. I see, yeah, in the, in the press and the Republica set up. Yeah, I mean, again, <coughs> it's a, it's a, a um, I think that was everyone's great hope. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I traveled through the region right after Trump was elected mm -hmm. uh, with the Atlantic Council, um, and we, uh, it, was, it was palpable mm -hmm. the extent to which uh, leaders all across the region felt that this was a huge reset and a huge opportunity to renegotiate everything, that everything since the, the wars in the 1990s right. was now up in the air. Even Cheshire was celebrating. I Everyone was celebrating. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and uh, that's, uh, uh, happily, that's proven not to be the case, mm -hmm. uh, largely because, again, um, the, um, the administration, the, the larger administration, saw the benefits of continuity and it has been able to still push, I think, right. partnership with the European Union. It, will that hold? Uh, I, it's anyone's, quite, anyone's guess at this point. Montenegro, uh, newest NATO member, would you, would you say, you mentioned Macedonia already, what are the next steps for NATO in the region? The summit's coming up 10th, 11th yeah. of June, uh, July. Um, will there be any more, if not invitations at least, open door to new countries? Uh, you know, I, it's, it's, uh, we'll see what the Trump administration says about Bosnia. I think mm -hmm. there was some talk about uh, at least making positive noises about yeah. uh, mm -hmm. about about Bosnia and NATO. Mm -hmm. um, Bosnia's crisis, though looming, is uh, is, is is much bigger than NATO. Uh, you know, I think that that will mm. you know overshadow any sort of questions about NATO for uh, um, for the time being. I, the 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 success story is uh, is Macedonia. Mm -hmm. And uh, the interesting thing to watch there is that uh, Sergei Lavrov and I, I think the UN ambassador also said we're fine with the name issue. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, they say this, but they've also, as I understand it, been pushing in Greece to yeah. try and get it blocked and are uh, also pushing the uh, Vimero, yeah. Vimero in, uh, in Macedonia mm -hmm. to, to block it on their end. Um, so we'll see how they play that game. But mm. they again reiterated that Macedonia and NATO is a red line for them, just like Montenegro was a red line for them. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we know that uh, that red line did result in, in actual, you know, spy shenanigans that, that attempted mm. coup. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, you know, uh, NATO and Macedonia are the one to watch and, again, to see how, how Russia plays it.
there. Macedonia, of course, is very important for Kosovo as well yes. because uh, resolution of the name uh, and, let's say, progress towards both NATO and EU membership, I think, would clearly help to stabilize uh, the region. Certainly. Um, so the Albanians, again, play a major role in Macedonia. Yes. As a quarter, more or less, of the population. Yes, yes. So how do you see this developing? You know, I'm... You said Macedonia is a success story. I don't think we should jump ahead yet. No. We've still got parliamentary True. ratification in both countries True. and the referendum. True. So how do you see? I think it would be a hot summer, actually. How I, I, mean, I, 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 I perhaps overspoke there. I absolutely agree with you. It's, uh, it's, uh, there are many ways this, this can still go wrong. Um, uh, it's, it's, the, it's a breakthrough that we've had right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we can keep pushing that momentum, mm -hmm. um, that would be really big for the region, as you said. Uh, it's far from a foregone conclusion, and there's mm. many, many ways, including, you know, whatever shenanigans Russia gets up to, uh, that can that could easily derail this. It's a good opportunity, though, for both NATO and the EU to push this, to jump on this opportunity Absolutely. now and really open those doors to, Absolutely. to Macedonia. Absolutely. What impact, if it is successful, what impact will this have on Serbia-Kosovo? Because presumably there'll be some momentum that if the Greeks and the Macedonians can resolve the problems, why not you? you you've certainly also heard these, uh, these stories uh, uh, about um, that Vucic is, is pushing for uh, some sort of territorial swap. Mm -hmm. um, it's a paper that came out from uh, the liberal-leaning think tank in, in Belgrade mm -hmm. uh, also just last week. Uh, urging the United States to, uh, to, to back this. And mm -hmm. if I read that paper correctly, I only skimmed it, uh, to be fair. Uh, it wasn't even talking about a swap, but just a, uh, an actual changing of the, right. the, the demarcation line. I, uh, I personally think these are not the right ways to go about these things. That's not going to fly in Pristina. And that's not going to fly in Pristina. <laughs> that said, uh, you know, I, it's uh, right. On the one hand, Pristina had a, the, the longest fight on the... Uh, uh, the Montenegrin border demarcation, which mm -hmm. was which was really a, it's almost an administrative no thing, a no-brainer. <laughs> now this idea that that this would be able to fly. That yeah. that said, I've heard that that um, there's some sort of support for this idea among uh, uh, with uh, with President Tachi as well. So, uh, you know, I, these are all rumors that we hear yeah. from from here. I don't see how that's politically a a even a possibility, um, and uh, I I would imagine that it's it's not getting any uh, any traction in European capitals um, mm -hmm. at all. Uh, but uh, so will will uh, uh, resolution Macedonia move the ball forward if mm -hmm. uh, the moving the ball forward in Belgrade right now is uh, changing borders in Kosovo is having some sort of concession given to them mm -hmm. on that. I'm not sure it will necessarily. Mm -hmm. That's uh, if that's where we are, we're we're not in a particularly hopeful place on yeah. On, on, on in those negotiations, I would say. I mean, dealing with the Balkans for over 30 years, I always say you, if you get good news in the morning, be careful because you're going to get bad news by the end of the day. I think that's right. Vice versa. Yeah. So there's both positives and negatives. You mentioned Bosnia. Can you sort of outline for our viewers, I mean, much of our audience in Kosovo and, and, and other uh, Albanian areas may not be uh, following Bosnian developments that closely. What is the danger emanating from Bosnia? The danger emanating in Bosnia is that the, uh, the, the elections in October may not yield a government. Mm -hmm. um, and then if there's no government, the uh, place is not governable. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be, uh, to be uh, uh, as simple as possible about it, and then no budget is passed. And mm -hmm. then I think we're on a, a time frame of... Um, you know, the money runs out at some point early 2019. Mm -hmm. So then right. it's a sort of a, um, this will focus attention uh, to the problems of Bosnia, the fact that uh, it's, it's not able to govern itself right now. I, um, I don't know what the easy solutions to this are, mm -hmm. whether it's, uh, uh, you know, getting the high representative involved and what, what kind of... Uh, um, what kind of solutions are even likely and possible uh, right now for Bosnia? I, I, I know that the danger that I look at uh, as, again, when we're talking about these sort of drawing lines, mm -hmm. is that uh, Republika Srpska may, at this point, look for an opportunity to then say, okay, well, this is clearly not working, we're done here, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, make some sort of irrevocable moves, some sort of referenda or whatever. Mm. That then just claim complicates its, failed state. its own state, failed yeah. state, we're mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. um, 
this is a huge problem that mm -hmm. uh, will require a lot of energy uh, from the European Union and uh, the United States to address. Mm -hmm. um, I'm generally concerned that given the state of the world that uh, attentions won't be focused till well after October on exactly what's happening mm -hmm. there. Um, and uh, I don't think that's necessarily that it'll be too late then, but uh, it, would be, it would be good that, that we were really thinking about this harder uh, at the highest levels already. And you think this could degenerate potentially into violence again in Bosnia? I don't know. Um, it's a different situation than it was mm -hmm. um, in the 1990s. Uh, older populations. Mm -hmm. um, there's no neighboring state sponsoring a war. As there's there was no neighboring in, yeah. state sponsoring the war. Um, that said, you know, again, um, what I least like about the Bosnia situation is that, uh, you know, neither Serbia nor Croatia, quite frankly, are uh, playing <laughs> incredibly constructive roles mm -hmm. at this point. Um, that's one starting point for, uh, for pressure, I would say, from the outside. I mean, mm -hmm. Bosnia is uh, itself... Um, it's a, it's a hornet's nest of uh, institutional problems and uh, things that need to get fixed and mm -hmm. things that don't mm -hmm. need to get fixed. Um, and how one approaches that, uh, again, it's, it's, it's a little beyond my, my level of comfort to, to start speculating on that. Mm. But I would say on the, in the bigger picture, uh, the pressure should be uh, brought to bear on uh, both Belgrade and Zagreb now from the outside to... Uh, play a constructive role in a very, very delicate, I think, period coming up now. Mm -hmm. Not not to be uh, playing and to, you know, as clearly as possible, make it clear that, you know, there are consequences to, to not playing a con uh, constructive role in, right. in Bosnia's future. The trouble, of course, then, once again, as always, is the role of Russia, uh, mm -hmm. who uh, are, in fact, backing Dodik in the Republika Srpska mm -hmm. and always stand behind... Uh, behind Vucic and Serbia to, again, play a spoiler role in there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, uh, that's, that's where we are on Bosnia. And then, again, you know, the, the, the question of, of Kosovo then also, uh, it's, it's another sort of torque point where the Russians can play. Uh, mm -hmm. Statements that they stand behind Serbia on Kosovo, you know, coming uh, fast, fast and furious these mm -hmm. days. Um, so yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot to be concerned about there. And there's always possibility for not only manipulation but provocations. Absolutely. Uh, actions like they did in Montenegro. Absolutely, absolutely. The coup attempt. In terms of the European Union, would you say the EU has done enough to get these countries on track for membership? And I have a sort of follow-up question about the importance of the Union, but have they done enough? I. I'm not sure that's exactly the, the right question, right? It's, it's in the sense that the European Union's approach to getting countries ready is a checklist and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and then obviously they aid and they, they, mm -hmm. they, they help, but it's, um, to a certain extent, the, uh, the political culture of a lot of these places is one of, of uh, patronage networks, mm -hmm. um, Deep corruption to a certain extent, which mm. uh, is problematic, and it's how do you mm -hmm. how do you break that? I'm not sure that anyone really has the answer to that. How you right. reform societies like these? But remember, they brought in Bulgaria and Romania. The, the problems there were no different. That's true. That's true. Um, That's what I mean by not enough. In other words, is there some discrimination involved here? I mean, look. Uh, people have complained about Bulgaria and Romania coming in, and 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 you see to a certain extent. Uh, even what's happening in Hungary right now, it's mm. a certain kind of backsliding. Mm -hmm. And you see a, a almost a steady state for a lot of these countries, that even the countries that have made the largest steps in reform, right. that in many ways it was, it was skin deep, and that the, the, the parties themselves still practice this kind of uh, patronage politics, mm -hmm. and that are now reasserting themselves in, all, in, in these countries in a big way. Mm. Um, so to a certain extent, uh, one could argue that the European uh, accession project um, has, all, has across the board been been more skin deep, I mean more or less skin deep, and, mm -hmm. and that, that challenges are being faced across, uh, across the board. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what does this mean for the accession uh, of the Balkans to the European Union? I mean, uh, the, the, the summit with uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron's statements in, in Sofia recently, again, uh, you know, after a, a 
consensus paper on the Western Balkans was, was released and it looked like mm -hmm. um, there was some sort of movement forward. Again, there's, there's a lot of hesitation within the European Union about expansion at this point. Um, it's not, it's not surprising. It, uh, is it still important, would you say, for these countries to get into the European Union? I hear very few voices that are opposed to it. They understand the benefits of, of membership. But it's disheartening when, let's say, a government comes in in Italy or, yeah. or Britain leaves the European Union. People wonder, is this institution actually going to last? Is yeah. it going to fall apart? It's a great question. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say one other thing about... Um, entry into the European Union. Uh, and it's something that people write about it. It's not remarked on enough. Mm -hmm. um, all the countries that do get in, uh, Croatia not least uh, which, what you see immediately, and I think what it's something that you see uh, that drives the optimism for European integration in a lot of these countries, young people leave almost in, in droves to go take jobs uh, in the West. Mm -hmm. once, once, the, uh, uh, once you're in and right. you can have the ability to work, they leave. Um, this, I think, is driving a lot of the politics across the region, across Central and Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. this kind of this, uh, optimism uh, and uh, brain drain that, that, mm. that uh, departing these countries. So the importance of the European Union for the region um, it's hard to imagine any alternative, mm -hmm. um, and uh, but the the situation is is cloudy. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, I was saying earlier in a more hopeful riff. I think it's it's you look at it uh, again, maybe not in the next ten years, but looking further ahead, mm -hmm. is that that some kind of European Union does exist, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps perhaps not as centralized. Uh, hopefully still with Schengen, with better border controls, mm -hmm. uh, that these sorts of compromises, um, though they look very difficult at this point and are very hard fought, uh, do end up being made. Mm -hmm. um, that a, some sort of European Union that is beneficial to its members does persist, mm -hmm. uh, and that it still is a magnet for all these countries. Um, the importance of it is that, uh, again, uh, what the Eurasian Union that the Russians are pushing, that's, mm. no, that's nothing. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a non-project. Mm -hmm. The magnet it will always be there. Um, what it looks like, uh, it's hard to tell at this point. Dami, very last question. We only have a minute or so. I, I did want to get in a word about North Korea because of your, your background. I'm not sure how long you live there, how close <laughs> you follow. But who won the Singapore summit, with Trump or Kim? I don't think that's the way to look at it. Um, did Kim win anything? Look, it's true that Kim, it's one of the main things he's always wanted is mm -hmm. to sit down with the president. Mm -hmm. He got that. Did he have to give much up for it? No. Um, the only flip side is, is that uh, you, there was a, a lot of hand-wringing about uh, the stoppage of um, the um, military exercises with the mm -hmm. South. Right. Um, but you look at what the president said and looks what that actually means. He said, okay, we'll, we'll stop it for now. Mm -hmm. And again, immediately the administration started shading exactly what was meant by that and what level of cooperation. It does not mean that U.S. troops are pulling off the peninsula. And again, the sense was there that if, uh, you know, there's any sort of um, new shenanigans on the part of the uh, of Pyongyang, uh, I think that's one thing we do know about Trump is that his word on something like that, I mean, he'll pivot on a dime and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and reinstate those. So uh, yes, Kim got a, a level of recognition um, that he's craved for a very long time. Um, but overall, I'm not sure that that much has changed. actually changed. I suppose it, was, it dampened down the rhetoric a little bit, which was getting heated. But how long that will last, we don't know. That's true. Exactly. How long that will last? I don't think. I don't think we can even say that this is, you know, given how much of a breathing space for that, this is given. Damir, thank you very much. That was a very comprehensive uh, picture, particularly transatlantic relations, Trump policy. Remember, we're competing with the World Cup at the moment, yes. so I'm not sure when it's going to be shown. But again, thank you for thank you so much on the show. I thank you so it. much. Unfortunately, we have already come to the end of today's show. 
I have greatly enjoyed being with you and with my colleagues here at RTK and VOA. Good night, everyone. Stay healthy, be productive, and remain optimistic. See you all very soon. Miro Pafshim.